Welcome. Um, so I'm going to start with a poem. Um, and um, uh, so I want to welcome everybody. It's really lovely having you. And um, I, um, I realize that many of you, I don't know many of you. I want to really thank you for coming and supporting um, these two amazing uh, poets that we have today. So, um, so I'm going to read a poem at, from my book. It's called The Full Moon Herald. It's a poet, poetry <laughs> newspaper, and this is in the arts and entertainment section. Um, and it's called Paul Barton Plays Piano for Elephants. The piano fountainhead to a congregation of sick, abused, retired elephants. A man's hands skim the keys. Animals stop, listen, flap ears, reach trunks around to sniff aura of the instrument, aspect of the man. Elephants straggling about, free now, shielded. The piano sitting on the dirt in a park, surrounded. Picture it. Man playing Bach to a creature large enough to kill him, stomp up his keyboard. The elephant stands transfixed. The man gives bananas at first to make a good impression. It helps them memorize his smell, connect him to the sounds. He walks with a group sometimes, the blind ones. Even if they knew where the piano once got its keys, what would they do? Crush it? This cruel, splendid coincidence, this moonlight sonata under the stars, these behemoths swaying. And if you look up Paul Barton, uh, you, can, you can find videos of him playing for the, for the elephants. So let me, let me start by introducing um, Tom, who's going to be our first reader. <clears throat> so Tom Boswell is a poet, a freelance journalist, photographer, and community organizer residing in Madison, Wisconsin. His work has appeared in many journals and anthology. He won the National Poetry Competitions judged by Tony Hoagland, Louis Alberto Oria, and Robert Cording. He's the author of two chapbooks, Midwestern Heart and Neighbors, as well as this full collection that he's gonna read from tonight for the most part, called yeah. Heart on a String, which was just published um, by Grayson Books in 2020. And <clears throat> just a small comment about Heart on a String. Um, so Marilyn Taylor says, um, his moving personal stories of love and mortality simply do not lend themselves to paraphrase, but will take the reader's breath away. So I, how about if I say, take it away, Tom? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to start with uh, the first uh, poem from that book, Heart on a String, um, it's called Harvesting the Carrots. Ten years later, when it was finally over, she confessed she had fallen in love with me that late autumn afternoon while I squatted my back to her, harvesting the carrots. My eyes were fixed on the carrot tops, ferny green filigree promising thick scarlet roots burrowed in the soil. So I failed to notice that she changed that moment, her face, her eyes, the way she walked, when this thing she later called love swept over her. I do remember that the corn was behind us and how she turned then to photograph it as I tore out carrots and tossed them in a willow basket. I never understood what she saw in this garden she hadn't worked, or in the ravaged corn she'd make into a photo to hang on a gallery wall. 
for how these things she hardly knew could stir such deep emotions. But I've come to trust the way the bandit coon craves the corn, something pure and simple, lacking pretense. The photograph is one of those soft focus works of hers. You could hang any which way and still see something to satisfy you, so long as you were not hungry for corn. There was mullein, goldenrod, and bergamot still in bloom, and the wild carrot, Queen Anne's lace, which she claimed to love as well. I teased her, called it a wanton weed, useless renegade from overseas, but showed her as if it was a secret shared by just us two, the solitary purple blossom shuddering like a heart at the center of each bouquet. Gather enough of these over a summer, I said, and you can dye something, a skirt or shirt perhaps, a dark hue like the smudge of memory, a thing of beauty and utility, at least until the color fades. Could everybody hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, this next poem, uh, it did have seven parts to it, but uh, Ginny Connor, my editor at Grayson, suggested I didn't need the seventh one, so <laughs> she was right. And now it's a, a six-part poem. It's called Domestic Bliss. One, this town is way too tidy, too tedious, she protests. Just the yap of a dog next door. Thank God for that. Boxes still scattered on the floor. She laments the loss of city life. Wine and spit of traffic, sporadic gunshots late at night. Then the man in the elegant Victorian across the street shatters the god awful quiet, beating his young wife who runs into the street in a negligee as neighbors dutifully call the cops. She sighs with relief and wonders where to plug the toaster. Two, he remembers helping her move to Chicago where she never hung one picture on the white apartment walls. Now here they are together in this tame universe between city and farm. Three, he navigates the damp jungle of her clothes, bras, panties, socks, dangling like serpents from hooks, racks and chairs pictures himself an explorer on a strange new continent. Four, when they saw each other weekends, they read poems out loud in bed. Now they peruse pamphlets from the hardware in Farm and Fleet, pointing out which paint is cheapest and the best deal on a toilet plunger. When they walk uptown, they pass Church Street with its churches, School Street with its school, and Liberty with its library and post office. He frets he may be trapped inside a Norman Rockwell painting. Five, one day she grabs a magnet and posts a flyer titled Holy Relationships on the side of the fridge, like Martin Luther nailing his treatise to the cathedral door. But next to it is a list of Sunday chores, caulk the sink, grout around the tub, buy a mouse trap or find the cat. Six, she bought a book on tantric sex, but fell asleep in her sweats. The book spread open on her chest like a butterfly drying its wings. He looks at her sweet, tired face, her must hair, and reflects on the modest, sometimes messy nest they are making together. Waddle of twigs and twine, hope and habit, dreams and schemes and fear, and thinks perhaps they will be happy here. This uh, next poem um, is a reference to the Kickapoo, which is a, a river in uh, southwestern Wisconsin. It's called the windiness river in the world sometimes. And uh, it happens to be in an area of the state, uh, which includes part of Iowa and uh, Illinois, I guess, 
that was not hit by the glacier uh, 10,000 years ago. So they call it, it's the unglaciated area and it's also known as the driftless area. And I used to have a cabin out there for about 35 years. And I'm gonna read a little quote by Robert Bly that seems to relate well to the poem. He said, an event in the physical world hides behind it a spiritual truth. Fire can intervene between heavy earth details and the lightness of spirit. Perhaps fire is the only way to move from one to the other. The poem is called El Fuego. Once the biggest slash pile was blazing, so bold and beautiful, Pablo, at the cabin by the Kickapoo. I grabbed your book from the outhouse, the one that has sat there 20 years or more, docile as a peasant, with only the mice paying it any mind. It was nine o'clock sharp, the start of spring, and I was impatient to be rid of everything old or dead cold. So I opened your musty book to the poem you called El Fuego and read a few lines to the ear of flames, then tossed it on the bonfire while it was at its glorious zenith. I hesitate to say it was meant as absolution or consummation of anything I can name, but it felt right to watch the flames rise and flutter like butterflies, the ground scorched and charred around me, a harbinger of something new. And only then I thought about how the fascists had gathered your books from the homes and libraries and heaped them on the pyres in the streets of Santiago. The books crackled in the flames like roasting flesh, but the words leapt from the page and cried out in holy rage, like Joan of Arc, Norman Morrison, or Buddhist monks on fire in Vietnam. And the word was made flesh, and the flesh made word. This next uh, poem was inspired by something I, a little segment I heard in, on public radio one morning about Afghanistan, the longest war in US history. Um, I couldn't believe even in the American empire that somebody had the nerve to say this, but he did. The poem is called Government in a Box. And there's an epigraph. Uh, we've got a government in a box ready to roll in. General Stanley McChrystal, American commander in Afghanistan, February 2010. When the killing is nearly done, our government says it's going to deliver a brand new government in a box for those pathetic people who never had one as good as ours. But what kind of box, I wonder, to hold a whole government? A cardboard box, as big as a bread box, as small as a matchbox, toolbox, safe deposit box, shoe box, a wooden box made of boxwood shaped to look like a casket, a ballot box, lunch box, Pandora's box, jack in a box, perhaps a box within a box within a box, like Russian nesting dolls. Will there be a bow on the box? Will the box be wrapped with bright, bright tissue or just brown butcher paper? Will there be a key to open the box or a password or secret code or written instructions in their native tongue? Or will they need to use box cutters? And most important, who will be chosen to open the box? Who will choose the chosen? Will there be killing? I lived in uh, a town, I guess it was really a city on the, on the Mississippi River, uh, kind of uh, river cuts, cuts uh, Iowa and Illinois in half. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just read it. It's called River City. The statue of Mary holds her head in her hands while snakes bask on the steaming streets in front of the church. Strange immense trees on the bluffs 
thrust their arms out like sleepwalkers, and squirrels scampering in their shade are dark as devils. Just before dusk, locusts begin to hum, and the trees pulsate like some primordial power line. The sluggish river lingers and sulks. A big paddle boat is moored to the dock, glittering like a tawdry carnival. Tourists and townsfolk, pockets full of cash, parade on board, complacent as beef cattle. Fish leap from the water as if trying to become some new creature or enter another life. Bodies float downstream all day, but no one has a pole to fish them out. On an island close to shore, blackbirds swarm in the briars and young women, lips moist with worry, wait in the woods for the married men to come. Trains tremble by all night on the tracks by the river. Possum lurk in the alleys like rhinos and old men dressed in black sit alone in their bedrooms late into the sweltering night, dreaming of burning witches once again. This next poem, um, yeah, I had just moved back to Madison for about the second or third time and uh, planning to spend my life with somebody and we ended up breaking up, it was about two weeks before uh, Christmas, and the poem doesn't really have anything to do with the breakup. But uh, yeah, I remember driving to a friend's house while I was, where I was gonna stay for a while and hearing uh, Christmas carols on the radio. And, uh, and I still remember that moment. I think the whole poem came to me more or less at once. And it's called The Real Story. <clears throat> Let me get a drink here. <laughs> no, not meek and mild like the cards and carols claim. No, not this child. I swear he came, not whimpering, but howling wild like a wolf with the northwest wind. No gold halo like a ring around a planet to grace a beatific smile. Rather, a dark face already stained with joy and doubt, hints of anguish, betrayal, and pain to come. Hair damp and matted like the sheep that strayed here this dark night, not lured by angels' hymns, but by a cry so fierce and full of life and fury that they know in their woolly sheep hearts that this will be the blackest lamb of all, this wild, unruly child who will refuse to hearken to the call of kings or priests or even fathers, instead to follow a distant and lonely star. My last uh, chapbook was called Neighbors and uh, it was a pretty dark book. <laughs> I lived in a small town for a dozen years and all the stuff I wrote about was uh, really happened. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a lot of a lot of dark things. But th this poem's a little a little different. Uh, I noticed that uh, this, we're doing this reading at the beginning of springtime, and I just happened to cho choose a lot of poems about about spring. This one's uh, kind of appropriate for now, I guess. It's called the Service Berry. You had planned in your practical, persistent English manner that it would be spring when we visited your charming country estate. The same way I imagined that you planned this house and gardens resting on the last moraine of the last glacier. But it was cold that day, the wind still biting and blustery, the service berry, your prized possession, still hesitant to bloom. You had a husband of 60 years who needed cheering, his surgery scheduled for week's end. So you hid your worry while he, in his practical English way, wrote his epitaph. After brunch, we braved the wind and walked the hilly land. You, the polite but proud docent, 
pointing out each native shrub and flower, sometimes searching for its name like someone looking for a light switch in a dark room. I must confess I envied you again that day for all those living things that seemed to do your bidding. But now I think you found your bliss in creating, not controlling. Others say you could not suffer fools. And so I feel you would not fool yourself to think we can claim these neat kingdoms we fashion any more that we can dicker with death. How I despise it when obit writers or TV pundits remark that so-and-so's was an untimely death. Scripture says there's a time for everything, but whose death is ever timely? Not now, when fickle spring comes creeping in at last, when everything is waking and your service berry exploding with its clusters of white blossoms. Your husband was still healing in the hospital when you fell that night, found the next morning, the 1st of May, by your daughter. What caused the fall, heart attack or stroke, is anybody's guess. But the hypothesis is you died of hypothermia. You were li lying with your head by the bleeding hearts. No, let's not make those innocent flowers a bloody metaphor. It is what it is. A metaphor means to carry over. And every gardener knows nothing stays put where it's planted, no matter how precisely planned. You might just as easily have taken your final sleep by the maidenhair fern, the irises or hostas, or even the service berry. The tree claims so many names, Service berry, they say, because years ago, impatient couples would wait out the long, cold mountain winters until the preacher who rode the circuit would arrive to conduct wedding services, which was when the dirt roads were dry enough to traverse in house, horse and buggy, which was when the tree began to bloom. There's also shad bush or shad blow and June berry because that's the month the petite berries begin to ripen to blue. The songbirds love them, but I imagine you managed to pick some first and bake the cobbler for your husband and friends. Who will harvest the berries this year? Or would you be content to leave them for the birds? Will the frogs still be chattering in your ponds? What would the wild lilies you planted? if they could open their yellow throats and speak, utter at this most untimely time, when once again, all the world is bursting alive. So I got one more to read for right now. Um, this poem, uh, I was kind of grateful. It's had a, a long shelf life, so to speak. Uh, it won a, a contest that uh, Tony Hoagland was the judge. So it was uh, published in uh, an online magazine at the college where, in Houston where Tony uh, taught. And then later it was picked up by uh, an anthology of Midwestern poetry. And then the uh, poetry editor of uh, Rosebud magazine asked to publish it there. So it's, it's, had, a, it's had a good, good life. Uh, it's called, uh, after reading the first poem in the literary journal, I stopped to contemplate life and death. Excuse me. It was a good strong poem about how someone had died and how all his friends had gathered at the pub to ponder his passing in that old mystery of where we all go when we are gone. The world is turning towards spring as I flip to the back of the journal to peruse the listing of publications, awards, and brief bio. But the poet is past tense. He died of cancer in November. Never saw in print this good, strong poem about he and friends drinking to the memory of their deceased companion. Next week, I start a new job, my first nine to five in decades. 
For years now, the days have been rushing by like, well, the newly dead poet said it best, like bats at dusk. The way they whoosh across the darkening sky, web wing hands fluttering too fast to see. Each day I make a list of things to do and at day's end, to my disgust, I've checked off just a few. Now here, mocking me in, in this pile of unread magazines, the latest issue of ARP, did I subscribe? With the cover story, find a new job, make yourself relevant. I'd like to think I had been, but now I'm wondering if the dead poet, had he known he wouldn't live to see this last poem published, might have chosen a different piece to go out with. Perhaps one about ice cracking on a creek in spring, chickadees chirping in the morning, the first blush of green on a lilac shrub, or a crocus pushing through snow, rather than this good strong poem about he and his buddies drinking to a friend's demise, wondering where we go when we leave here, what's on the other side of life in those bats at dusk. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I see a, a common excellent mix of the serious and the humorous. And what a great poem to leave to leave us with, yeah, to go out on, as you say. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I'm going to introduce Debbie now. Um, and um, <clears throat> and here's what here's what I have for Debbie. Debbie, Deborah Backrack is the author of After I Stop Lying, which is uh, from Cherry Grove Collections in 2015. And the book she'll be reading mostly from tonight, Shake and Tremor, Grayson Books, published in 2021. She received a Pushcart honorable mention, and that is really hard to do, by the way, and has been published in journals such as Poetry, Ireland Review, Sweet, the Carolina Quarterly, and the Southampton Review, among many others. She's an editor, teacher, and tutor in Seattle, and um, she has a website that we'll post uh, in the chat. Um, so, and, and about Shake and Tremor, uh, Elaine Rose Glickman says, this collection is not a sacred text, but it is a revelation, brilliant, honest, painful, beautiful, and always unafraid. And I do have to say that um, we paired up our, our authors um, uh, haphazardly. It was not really, uh, <laughs> it wasn't like I tried to uh, to pair people up uh, in, in regards to their books. So, so you'll see uh, how these books are, are quite different and I think they fit together really well though. So, so um, uh, yeah, please read for us, Debbie. Okay. Uh, so first, um, thank you Phyllis for uh, putting this whole thing together. You really get credit for these Grayson readings and thank you for hosting. And thank you, Tom, I'm just, the, my problem with going second is my mind is still in these worlds that you created and it was such a joy to be there. Um, I also want to thank Ginny Connors, our wonderful editor for all of us here at Grayson Books. She's just an incredible um, partner to work with and as Tom was mentioning, helps you get your poem as great as it can be. And talking about great poems, I want to mention that Phyllis has this book, Phyllis, which I have been reading and very much enjoying, and I would recommend The Full Moon Herald from her. So um, this is a project book, meaning I started with an idea and, and the poems were written toward it. And it was based in a class I took in college called Feminist Interpretation of Scripture. So that was kind of the academic groundwork. And then I used my creative curiosity to further explore these ideas. So yes, um, there's a lot of Bible in these poems and no, I don't expect you to know the Bible. I'm gonna give you that background. So in the first poems, we're talking about 
Abraham and Sarah, who are the founders of the Jewish people. But when they first start in these poems, they're called Abram and Sarai. God promises them many, many descendants, but Sarai does not conceive. And then she demands that Abraham take her enslaved ser servant Hagar in her stead. A word for it. The Bible gives Hagar the word that grants her the dignity of a parasol in the desert. What of the roots, connotations, etymology? Words carry them around like a Vegas hooker with her fake leather purse of survival, with her fake ID tucked in a plastic cover, her real ID secured in a hidden pocket as she high heels it through hot grit. What the Bible calls Hagar matters. You remember her. She is the woman a wife gives her husband to give him the children guaranteed by God. She's not asked her opinion or even paid a percentage. There's a word for it. Not slave or servant, not maid, not concubine. Hagar, she who pours out blood in service to the mistress. Women's work. Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife. Genesis 16, three. All of them. Abram, Sarai, and Hagar, born into a time of quiet. No radio line hum, no buzz from broken transformers. You could hear the cattle in the far field. It's hard to imagine that level of quiet, how you could hear Abram's footfall, how it differed from Sarai's as it approached the flap in Hagar's tent, the tent made of goat skin, from the goat Hagar raised and fed and chastised and chased, and eventually, whose throat she slit, the goat whose carcass she butchered, meat she seared, whose hide she scraped, softened with its own brains, her own urine, because she knew how and she could. And now, as the supple skin Hagar stretched and tied is lifted, it whispers, survive. So in the book, I interweave poems about biblical people with people from the modern day struggling with similar issues. Uh, and in the case of the next three poems, sex and death. I am writing about fucking. Because I am human, I am not the only one. Because I like it. Because sorrow was taken. Because in Iran, the mullahs, the mullahs determine no film with even a slight touch, a, a fingertip against a cheek, a backlit shot of one shoulder against another, a hold even of consolation can be made. And yet the Iranian population tripled in the post-Shah era. So someone, and why not me, needs to write about fucking because it is terrifying because I am 47, but really I would have grabbed at 27, at 17, because it's not polite. And I am always very please and thank you because there are already enough words for snow, because of shame, that fishbone in the throat, because we are made of stars. This next poem is called The Polyamorous Understand You Don't Understand. And if you're not familiar with the term polyamorous, it means a romantic relationship with more than one person. The polyamorous understand you don't understand. I wanted a husband. The pumpkin settles in by the dark door. She did not. I wanted a child. Sideways teeth gone devil may care. She did not want one of her own. We wanted 
the same man, but not my son scrapes seeds from the pumpkin, he peers in its dark depths on the same days. He hugs the glow against his chest. She and I carry the son's pumpkin from her condo to my porch. Her laugh skips then jumps in like a frog out of season. My thoughts before death. I should have swum in the culvert, picked daisies and dandelions from cement cracks. I wish I'd fished the dream river, held on to math and Latin. I should have bowled more and better. I wrote you a letter the day I found out you had AIDS. This is back in the day T cells fell like North Dakota mercury, but not as pretty. I didn't send, and then pale skin, skin like raw silk, oh, bones with only sunlight for skin. Make sure I have a hat, wool socks, maybe those little hand warmers. When I am without words, no, I am always cold. So one thing I love about Bible stories is that they're open to so many different interpretations. And so in my reading, the master-slave relationship between Abraham and Hagar is also a love affair, part of a complex polyamorous dynamic. Hagar gives birth to Ishmael, Sarah gives birth to Isaac, and then she demands Abraham send Hagar away. And this next poem is from Hagar's point of view. The Affair. Tonight, I walk into the desert with one sack of water and my son. My body and ocean, I move with the moon. I did not demand a promise. I did not ask for my son, Ishmael, already curled in a grave-like hollow. An angel visits me on this road to Beersheba. Angel is the word I say when I mean strength of will, deep and abiding conviction. Angel is the word I say when I hear water rise up in the well. This next poem is an ekphrastic, meaning I wrote about a piece of art. Just a second. Um, uh, it's about Georgia O'Keeffe's painting, Morning Glory, which is in Chicago, and it's gigantic. Morning Glory. This flowers like floating on the moon, drifting in and out of dreams. I am a little afraid of all this space to be myself. From behind the petals, I see drawstrings and scaffolds, the magician's hat. I would have preferred uninitiated awe. Nuclear weapons scare me still, even though Reagan is dead, the bombs broken into pieces we could carry in our pockets. O'Keefe said she would make flowers so big, New Yorkers would have to stop and see what she sees in flowers. And we all know what she sees in flowers, the delicate opening, fold upon fold, the pink blush, the way the shapes stretch to glory. Today, O'Keefe would do set designs for Gaga. I got older, slower, sadder, came down from the clouds and found acid rain falling. I have less hope than I did before. I feel the dark unfold. O'Keefe might say, we are smaller than we know, the world more gracious. So in the book, I have, I have more poems about this story, but now we're going to move on to Lot and his wife. Uh, God promises not to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah if there are 10 good men in them. There are not. But the angels who will rain fire and brimstone and Sodom and Gomorrah go to Lot, Abraham's nephew, and promise to spare him and his family if they leave and do not look back. Lot's wife looks back and God turns her into a pillar of salt. 
Uh, this next poem is the title poem. And uh, in earlier drafts, it was called Lot's Wife Chance. And that's because in my mind, this is um, Lot's wife speaking, speaking after she's been turned into a pillar of salt. Shake and tremor. Still the blue heron lifts long legs over early morning. Still the blue green boulders filled with barnacles. Still the green ropes of sea. Still riblets in the sand, remnants of the night. Still I believe in the power of lust, the full shake and tremor of living on a moving planet that revolves around a ball of fire. Still the crabs, small and white, like moons in need, like promises unspoken, or promises spoken and unfulfilled. Still I wish to be swallowed whole by the sea. Still the sea, the spume and crash of the sea. Still the salt rich water coating my skin. Still my porous skin. So one of the questions that scholars and poets have struggled with forever is why does she look back? So here's my answer. Lot's wife, now a pillar of salt, addresses her audience. The woman in the third row on the left, the one who wishes she had a white parasol or lived in a world where parasols were not out of place, you are actually paying attention. You want to know why I looked back? I tripped. I caught a flash and thought, my wedding ring. I could picture my knitting, my frail peonies. I had two daughters in front and two behind. That was my body hanging from the city wall. So this next poem is not directly from a story in the Bible, it's from the Apocrypha, which are kind of the stories that were written around the Bible, kind of, well, I'm not, I wouldn't get myself into the Apocrypha because they were the ones that lasted forever. Um, but it, according to a legend, every day an ox would come and consume this pillar of salt, Lot's wife, licking it all the way down to the toes. It would be restored in the morning, and then this would happen again and again in the stories rarely told. The ox awakens, ears ring from the bellows in his dreams. He lowers his broken horns and walks. The ox comes slowly, swishing his long pink tongue. Dust and flies ride his hooves as he plods. He does not dread. He does what he must, lick. From her crown to her tendons, to the hard ridges of her toes, Lot's wife all ferocious salt. Hard grains send up small rockets as she dissolves. So I'm gonna read three more poems about Potiphar's wife. And then um, I'm gonna end with what is actually the first poem of the book and that a friend, um, we made it into a broadside so I get to show it to you. So later in Genesis, uh, Joseph, Abraham's great grandson, is sold into slavery in Egypt, and he becomes an overseer for Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officers. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph, but he refuses, and uh, she then falsely accuses him of rape. In Potiphar's wife's lockbox, and although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not consent to lie beside her or to be with her, Genesis 39.10. An egret feather, moon white, the great plumed arch, prize of hunters who strip the wild of its finery, once caressing the world high on her faithful head. A slice of sinuous calligraphy where promises lean in like the wind on a hot day, the loud, joyous crime of a bell in rain. The joker from the poker game she broke up in the servants' quarters, creased with punchlines. Her footsteps echoes on the empty stone patio, empty back room. The sour of olives overbrined. Her childhood cross-stitch sampler, 
Bless this home and all who enter. The slight sharp point of a seam ripper. Joseph explains how we got here. I took the job because I needed the job. That's why I've scrubbed griddles at McDonald's, lap danced for old drunks, took the slow Tuesday lunch shift for $2.35 an hour, no tips. I've crawled out of pits, worn chains. It was a full house there with Potiphar, his wife, the 10,000 candle maze. Potiphar's wife talks about that time. In the end, Joseph did all right for himself. Because he was in the dungeons, he called the dreams. And from there, he worked it like he worked it in my husband's home, putting together puzzles of rain, watching hands, oh, he watched, roll pastry dough on marble tabletops. I saw the oasis shimmer at the edge of the horizon, like I had been walking toward it my entire life, like I had been crawling on my hands and knees. And now I'm going to um, show you this wonderful broadside, which has art from my friend, Marcy Swift. And this is the first poem in the book, actually. When God is a woman, she does not accept apologies for the incessant thrum. She explains obtuse angles, how to lay cable. She understands that tigers eat alligators. She set it up that way. She rides the New York subways, looks strangers in the eye. She has her first child at 90, changes her name. It's amazing what a woman can accomplish when she is not afraid. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Wow. Um, tigers eat alligators. She set it up that way. <laughs> yeah, I found myself getting the chills as you were reading. Um, so you know what I'd like to do now is um, is open up, uh, have people unmute, um, and um, I thought maybe first let's um, let's make some comments. Let's just uh, uh, give these two wonderful poets um, some of our comments that things that you might want to say. Um, to them, and then then we'll then we'll look to questions. So, um, and I can start. Um, I, uh, I I um, well, I wrote down the lines of some of your poems that I I both of you that I just thought were so uh, engaging and captivating, and um, when I heard them again, it it just it felt like I was kind of hearing an old friend in a way. Um, and um, um, I, I, um, what I said about the visceral reaction that I was having is um, I could feel that, that cow, was it a cow licking? Ox. Lot's, I'm sorry, an ox licking Lot's wife. So, and the, the feeling of um, from the head to the toe and being covered in salt like that and just kind of the feeling of being a woman and being in, frozen like that had a lot of meaning for me. Um, and, and for you, Tom, I was thinking a lot about the, the poems you read. Well, all of the poems you read, and specifically I was comment, wanted to comment on the, on the political ones and the, the uh, government in a box was one. Um, it, just, it just had such resonance for me. Um, I tend to write a lot of political poetry um, and um, I really did appreciate the poetry that you read about war. Um, so so that, that's, that's where I'm coming from. Does anybody else have a comment that you'd like to make or, um, or a question? Um, at, so we have, I'll read what's happening in the chat. Um, Lori is saying, thank you, Debbie, you do so much for writers to midwife their own voice. It's a beautiful way of saying it, to midwife. Hearing yours today was such a treat. We are made of stars. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Maybe 
other people have written poems about that. I have actually about Stardust. Yeah. I have a question for Deborah. Yep. Yeah, please. So since you are so interested in um, providing a voice for biblical characters and biblical stories, where's your poem about your name? Uh, it's coming. I wrote it. It's it's in process. Um, yep. I, I have that. That one's in the works. Okay. It's not done. It takes me years, years and years. Oh, I'm glad I'm not in the same. I'm in the same boat as you are. <laughs> so here's a question for both of you. How is it for you to disclose personal information in your poetry? And I guess maybe we've already been talking about that, really. So. I don't know if that's a repeat of, um, do you think it is? I can find another question if you think that's a repeat. Do you want to talk about that maybe, Tom, a little bit or? Say it again. <laughs> uh, um, how do you, how, how is it for you to disclose personal information in your poetry? For instance, you know, your book is a lot about breaking up. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really touched by that when I, when I read your book, um, I, it really moved me that that's what was there. I could really relate to it. Um, and I don't know that I've read a lot of books who have that, have that theme. So, um, is that, how is it for you to put those things out there? Um, I guess it's almost kind of like therapy. <laughs> I don't talk about it a lot. I mean, I mean, I don't even think about it a lot. Uh, yeah, most of my, I mean, I, we have a couple of people in my writing group who, you know, I'm going back to what Debbie was saying earlier, who, who, as far as I can tell, really never are writing about themselves, although I think their selves come into the poetry, but they're really more like, fiction writers who are write, writing in verse. Mm -hmm. um, they're writing stories. And of course, I, my things are sort of st stories. I definitely write narrative poetry. But um, yeah, it's uh, it can be awkward or embarrassing because some of the people I'm, I'm writing about I, I still see. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I think it's kind of a therapy of sorts. Um, and then again, it's not all, it's all, you know, it's truth and it's not truth. You know, it's a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think That's I had right. a conversation with Ginny about a poem and where um, I guess she found it unbelievable. <laughs> I read it tonight, but it's sort of surreal, but um, in one sense, it's all true. In one sense, it all happened, but uh, it's, it, a lot of it happened metaphorically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really good point, yeah. And, and even the first poem I read, you know, uh, Harvesting the Carrots, um, I would say a lot of that maybe more happened metaphorically, uh, although it also happened, you know. So, yeah, that's about all I can say yeah, about it. Actually, right. And that's inherent. Yeah. I, in, in, I guess that's true of all poetry is that, and I just maybe made that error is that we tend to think that it's um, the truth, but it's, uh, that's really up to the author's discretion. Yeah. What you put in there could be the truth. It might not be. So, so we shouldn't assume that. I'm uh, lucky enough to be able to teach creative writing myself, and I remind my students, as the gentleman with Paula Jones there did, that there is no I in poem. In fact, there's a considerable distance between you and what you're putting on the page. And so uh, at Stephen King, I think it is, that notes that um, his least favorite question, and the one he's asked most of the time, is, where do you get your ideas? But the question that I find when I read or when I'm at a reading and someone's answering questions, that always surprises me is, did that really happen? And of course the answer is no, but the poem did. So I, I try to sidestep that autobiography 
question by just pointing out that the poem itself is what we're what we're expressing, what we're presenting. So that's what should be dealt with. The only thing I would add to all of this is that's how I feel and that's a common artist feeling. But I sometimes forget that the word mom and cancer and whatever is right there in the poem. And I'm suddenly reading it, my mom's in the room and I'm kind of, you know, it comes slamming back close again. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think what you said about letting it, letting the writing go where it needs to go, letting it take you somewhere and that um, we don't always know where that's going to be when you start out, right? Right. Mm. Have you ever had the scenario sort of going one step further that someone that not whether or not the material is about you, but if it's about someone else in your life, you know, so like someone else says, is perhaps offended because of something you wrote and it's critical or something like that. You know, I think that's something that any writer has that problem is that the people around them say, well, that was about me, you know, and maybe it was, uh, but maybe it's an amalgam of people, you know, with a particular issue or situation or something like that. So I'm just one, that's always really hard as a writer to just like actually get out on the page exactly what you, want to get out there and then determine what is going to be seen by other people later on. So I'm just wondering if, if you've had that experience, like how do you navigate other people? Um, so, so I have a few, couple answers. One, Tony K. Bambara has a great essay about this, mm -hmm. about people assuming it's about them and demanding royalties and it's hilarious, but, um, I keep that in mind that it's that it's this amalgam. It's not that person. The thing that's more an issue for me is it my story to tell. Like mm -hmm. I tried to write a poem about a friend of mine whose son was in the hospital, and um, I, I went to help. So I had I had those details. Like Tom is so beautiful with those details. I had the details, but I eventually decided it was not my story to tell. I did not have a right to this story. Um, and maybe I'll, maybe Lilith, something will happen to Lilith that will be like this, but not just talking about this woman and her son and he's screaming and it, it wasn't, um, it was inauthentic because it wasn't mine and it wasn't just. Mm. Good point. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're about ready to have you take us um, take us out with uh, one more poem. Okay. So, yeah, thank you everybody for coming and thanks for the amazing conversation. And um, why don't, yeah, um, let's see. So, so Debbie, why don't you go first and then Tom will. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm Jewish, if that wasn't, well, of course it wasn't obvious because anybody could write these poems, but I'm Jewish and um, as part of um, Judaism, there are the high holy days where you blow a shofar, a ram's horn, and um, you, there are three different calls, Tekiya, Shivarim, and Teruah. So this poem refers to all of that. Why I return to water. Long twists of bull kelp, I fill them like a shofar. Tikiya, silver sharp. Shivarim, the curve of the shore. Terua, the curve of the sky. I bury my body in sand, dribble a bit on my leg and pause. I try again, dig deeper, and now my legs start to merge with day and night, with what shifts and settles. Deep in the ocean, sand, remnants of kings and decrees, the code of Hammurabi comes to write on my skin. The ocean's just barely alive. The moon pulls waves through my body. Something will come to me, a seagull, a grain of sand. I will know my place in the world. Thank you. Okay, Tom. Okay. Um, when I brought this poem to my 
writing group. Uh, yeah, like a, it was just called the dream, I think. And somebody said, no, there's probably a thousand poems named that. <laughs> so uh, I, I actually like simple names for poems, but uh, so I stole this uh, line from some other poet, I think. <laughs> so the poem's called, in the English language, there's only one word for dream. We are playing tennis in the basement of the house we had walked away from. The house that was ours no more. You going back to the city, me where? But here we are swatting the ball back and forth, intense and agile. At one point I push an old sofa out of the way and the flurry of volleys persists. There is no net between us. I hit the ball at you in a fury and then it morphs into a butterfly and I'm sleeping restlessly this night after the doctors have unclogged once more the pathway to my heart. Mm. This heart battered but still beating, sucking in blood, flushing it out. And now the sweet breath of another day as the ball, wings a flutter, floats away. And I can't remember if we are keeping score in what part love plays. Mm. Mm. Oh, thank you. Beautiful. <clears throat> thank you so much. And um, thanks everybody for being here. That was really, really moving. Very lovely. Mm -hmm.